first off, I, I want to say thank you for joining us here on the Zoom. I know a lot of people have been having a lot of questions, and I'm sure you guys have been getting a lot of questions as well. So I guess we'll go ahead and start here. Um, so far, with your new roles in Dieter, how is it going so far, and what have you, uh, what do you feel like you've been able to accomplish? I'll start with uh, Alisa. Thanks. Um, well, uh, I'm new to Dieter, so uh, I think this is my third week. Uh, there is a lot to learn, um, and what uh, what I think uh, we are, I think, starting to be able to do is help explain to folks what the process includes. Um, there are two systems and a lot of steps, so I think one of the best things we're able to start doing is provide clarity to folks on sort of the shortest path to get their uh, case uh, resolved and uh, if they're eligible to get them paid. Uh, so that's one of the things we've worked on. I know uh, Barbara will be able to talk about several of the other initiatives. Barbara? Um, from my point of view, I'm to laser focus in on the backlog and getting folks their claims resolved. Um, payment if they're eligible or a, a reason if they're not and a right to appeal. Um, so, so mostly what I've been trying to focus on is the backlog. At the same time, there's been effort to uh, also just look at the entire system new folks are being hired, right? Uh, the solutions are IT, they're staffing, um, so that the longer term is being looked at as well, but I'm trying to focus most of my efforts on the backlog. That's kind of one of the next questions I'll, I'll ask about that. Um, I'm guessing that's your, obviously your first thing you're trying to tackle here or, or get something done there. Um, what do you think is going to help the backlog? What do you think uh, is going to be need to be done to address that? Because obviously a lot of people still waiting on their benefits. Yeah, so, so one of the first things that we're doing is quantifying it, exactly how many have been waiting since um, August 1st when the um, strike force was developed. What system are they waiting in? Is it PUA? Is it regular UI? And then identifying which ones can we clear out the fastest? So one of the things that we're doing is we have a, a private sector volunteer who is working with Dieter to analyze the folks who are waiting, separating out those folks who look like they're eligible. Um, for example, in PUA, there's, there's a serious number of criminals who have filed claims, right? And so we don't want to pay them, but we got to pay the Nevadans who are desperate and waiting. So we're using technology to separate those two out. And then for folks that um, look eligible, then we're looking at, hey, how do we process them the quickest? Uh, for example, the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services are putting 200 of their welfare workers uh, through a training right now to be able to work on these claims. Um, so part of it is redeploying people to help, uh, kind of like states have used the National Guard. Well, right now we're using uh, this strike force of welfare workers who wanna get in and help people and help get them paid. So it's kind of a remarkable amount of teamwork that's happening right now. And Elisa, I'll ask you the same sort of question in a moment, but on that, the talk of the, the welfare workers, where are we with that process? You said they're being trained right now. Is there has there been any um, increase in the amount of people receiving their claims since the welfare workers have started or since you've been in your role to address this backlog? So, uh, you know, one of the things that we need folks to understand is that in order to be eligible for unemployment benefits, you have to meet a fairly narrow set of legal criteria that are set up in the federal law. Uh, unemployment is designed to help people on a short-term basis uh, so they can get back on their feet and get back to work. Um, because we are dealing with a system that is created and defined by federal law, uh, we, we must assure that people who are answering the phones have gone through the training. 
So literally there are um, just shy of 200 welfare folks going through the training this week and next week. It's a, normally a two week training, but they're doing it uh, after hours because uh, they are still have to do their regular day jobs for the division of welfare. Um, so, so the, the, um, so they can't start helping people until they've completed the training. That's, that's part of the federal requirements. Um, but what we are doing in the meantime, as Barbara has said, is we are looking at all the other tools we have to possibly be able to deal with folks who are in a similar situation and deal with them as a group and move their, their, uh, their claims through the process as much as we can. I did want to specifically mention we're piloting a partnership with IDME, which would take folks who we just need to verify their uh, identity. We're, gonna, we're trying to see if we can take that step of the process out of our system and give it to um, IDME to have them do that piece, and then it can come back into our system much more quickly. Uh, so if folks do get these uh, emails from Dieter asking them to go to IDME to verify their identity, that is a legitimate test that we are running to see if we can use that to speed up that one step in the process. And where are we with the IDME? Is that, are those emails, have some of them been sent already or those people should be, people will be checking their emails for those? Yes, you should check your email. We sent a small pilot in the regular uh, unemployment system, and we are this week sending a couple thousand emails in the PUA system. So folks should be watching for that. And the sooner they go through the process, the sooner we can get those, um, those cases back into the system and onto their next step in the process. Well, with that, um, with the welfare workers and this ID need, do you expect the amount of people being processed move along a lot quicker? Do you expect a, a greater number of people to get their, their payments sooner? Um, this is Barbara. Yes. Um, we're, we're using a number of different techniques to speed up the process. ID me. Um, using batch checks on eligibility through IT. The welfare workers, if um, it, you know, they're already going through the training, so that next week, if we say, hey, we need 50 workers to help process uh, 500 people approved by IDME, we'll have them ready. So it's a combination of new techniques and to get the folks who are eligible approved and those who, as Elisa said, there's some people who aren't eligible, but we gotta get them an answer, right? So they're not just waiting and not sure if they qualify or not. And then of course they get the right to appeal if they disagree. But we want everyone to get an answer. Whether it's good news or bad news, people, people need to know. And we'll get to the topic on, of appeals in a little bit, but um, and I'm sure you've seen the news stories and I'm sure you've seen, you maybe have heard messages or emails or these people out there. Um, waiting. So there's some defense of people waiting from the very beginning of the pandemic and still haven't, are still in limbo. I mean, are you guys, how are you going down the chain of the backlogs? Are you addressing maybe the first ones filed first or how does that work? Yeah, so the system um, always, uh, the system is designed and, uh, to sort of give uh, the claims workers individual tasks to process and those are um, always in sort of uh, in date order of received. Um, so that we are starting from the very beginning of the process and we've, I think we've gotten through several months. So, but for folks, so that's sort of the straightforward going through the process. Um, then if you get to a decision uh, and a lot of claims in traditional uh, UI have, we've, we've made the first sort of decision in the process, which is uh, you know, you've told us that you quit, uh, that you were laid off from your job and your employer has told us that you uh, quit. Uh, those, that is a, 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 a decision point that actually requires uh, a worker here to um, give due process consideration to both sides of the equation. So that, that puts you into a different line. We're starting from the beginning of that line too. Uh, but you may have, you know, you may have 
been put into or had a decision made that puts you into a different step in the process. Uh, and I think they're all moving at slightly different times. Um, so that is, uh, we're trying, one of the things that's gonna happen as we bring more folks on board to help uh, answer phones and process claims is we'll be able to let more folks know exactly where they are in the process. So they have at least some sense of where they're sitting. We just haven't, because of the number of claims, been able to really be able to update everyone on where they are in the process. But all of the lines are moving from, you know, the oldest, the, the first filed to the most recently filed. And then Barbara, I don't know if you can, or either of you can talk about this, but the, the people who are coming on to help out, are, are any of them um, working in one specific area or are they all gonna be dispersed into different, different I mean, adjudication, appeals, uh, anything like that? There's three groups of people coming on to help. There's uh, part-time welfare uh, eligibility workers. There's retirees. We have retirees who used to work for the um, unemployment division and who used to work for the welfare division who are coming on um, and say, we'll work for six months until there's not only no backlog, but anyone newly applying is processed quick. So we never wanna have a backlog again. And then there's new hires, right? Folks where th the office was staffed for a 3% unemployment rate. Well, it, you know, it's statewide. Um, it, I mean, in Clark County, what is it? 14%, 15%? I mean, uh, we need to staff for that level so that people can call, talk to one, find out what their claim is, answer questions, and get, get their case resolved timely. So that's the goal. That's what we're working on. Uh, so I, I've been in talks with people, um, claimants in the past, I think it was a couple weeks ago. Many people thought they were part of a mass denial. A lot of people got the same letter on the same day. Um, have you heard anything about that? And, and would you consider that a mass denial? Or what happened there? I don't know if you can address, address that. Yeah, so um, this is Elisa. The, uh, what happened there was um, a lot of people uh, were uh, under the impression that they could choose which one of the two systems that they filed in. Maybe they filed in both. Um, so we had a lot of folks in the PUA system, which was the, the unemployment system that Congress created for a specific set of folks who didn't qualify under regular unemployment. Um, and the, the federal law, however, which maybe did not get as much publicity as if you have W-2 wages in the last year and a half, essentially, you must go through regular unemployment first before you can go through the PUA system. And, and even then, again, remember, you have to meet very narrow criteria to qualify and either be eligible in either system for payment. So uh, there were quite a few people who were in the PUA system that we had determined, because we've, we can look at wage data, that they had W-2 wages that would make them uh, eligible and required by federal law to go through the regular unemployment system first. So uh, mass denial is not the right terminology. What, what they had was a, uh, we did a determination and because of the way the PUA system is built, we, we, we can send these notices out all at one time uh, and that's kind of how it works in the process right now. We're working to be able to send individual notices as they come up, but that we don't have that functionality yet. So uh, we, we had a lot of folks who received the same notice on the same day. Um, uh, and really it's a, a determination that you must go through the UI system first. You have eligibility there. You should apply, uh, a, a significant portion of them had applied and had actually started getting paid in the regular unemployment system. They just need to go back and start filing their weekly claims again. And if they hadn't applied in UI, they should apply and, and they'll, uh, if eligible and they meet all the other criteria, they will start getting paid. Uh, and 
it just is a function of the way the system is so far um, that we can only sort of give those notices in mass, but uh, it, it wasn't. Um, so that's, that's what happened. It was just a determination of the shortest next step to get where you need to go. Of course, as Barbara said, they can appeal that, um, but, but that is not the shortest step to them getting benefits if they are eligible. The shortest step is to follow the federal rules, go to regular unemployment, and go through that process. And, and on that topic, a lot of people, I'm sure you come across, are a little bit confused because, um, hey, I, I had a W-2, but I also did a lot of gig work, uh, and then they get these, the letter like you had mentioned. Um, any suggestions for those folks? Um, we're we're going to go look at our notices to see if we can make it a little bit more clear and a little bit less uh, technical communication with folks. But if you had W-2 wages in the last year and a half, uh, and especially if you've gotten a notice from us saying you need to start in regular unemployment, by the federal rules, you have to start in regular unemployment and uh, go through that system uh, exhaust those benefits first before you can go to the um, PUA system. And yes, a lot of folks are trying to start their own business and are gig workers because of the economic issues, but, but unemployment itself takes a look back at the last year and a half to see uh, what, what, where your uh, income came from. And then that sort of determines where you need to start in the process. And Barbara, is there anything on those topics that you want to talk about at all? Yeah. I mean, uh, Joe, what we would like to see happen in the ideal world is that we call every single one of these people and we explain the, the difference between the two. We make sure they're filing in the right system to get their benefits. It's a little while off before we can call every single person, but communication is part of the goal here too, right? Uh, let's make it easier, let's make it clearer. That's our long-term goal. Uh, we, we touched on appeals earlier, or you mentioned it, and uh, I, I've interviewed several people who, who are in the appeals process. Um, they've sent their appeal in. What's the timeline for someone with who sends an appeal? And I know everyone's different, but um, and what's being done to address the uh, I'm sure thousands of appeals you receive? So uh, with PUA appeals, right? PUA is a new program. So the computer system is being finalized to kind of arrange the hearings, but the same hearing staff that do the UI here at appeals will be doing the PUA appeals. They are getting ready. Um, in the meantime, the staff is prepping the cases for appeals, and along the way, they're finding some mistakes, right? A newer worker, um, for example, may have denied someone a PUA claim and they're found eligible. So they're fixing them as they go along. And then the rest, they're going ahead and preparing so that the hearings can begin. The last estimate I heard was mid-September for the hearings to begin. Um, but there'll be a, a, an opportunity to state their case and it's an opportunity for mistakes to be fixed and in the case they're truly not eligible that you know the, the hearing officer will render their decision. But it's a needed part of the process that, that it needs to go forward. It's a check and balance, right? And everyone has that right to, to go through that process. So basically if, you, if you've sent an appeal and you filed an appeal, you're gonna be waiting through at least September to, to get mid-September to get your, uh, your turn, right? That's my understanding of the timeline, yes. And then are any of the workers coming in gonna be able to help out with the appeals process at all or the, uh, the appeals backlog, I guess, that there will be? We're, so the way it's working is uh, as we're training, yeah, I mean, new, as I said, as we're training new folks, we're putting them on the, the sort of first level tasks to give them experience and letting the experienced folks who um, particularly for those who have an appeal in PUA, the, the appeals officers really have to have an understanding of both systems. So we're kind of uh, moving experienced folks up to handle the complicated cases and bringing new folks in to handle the routine cases. Um, we still are, just so folks know, 
pretty much able to handle in regular unemployment, we are processing and getting final determinations and payments to eligible folks on 90% of the cases. That work uh, doesn't get a lot of media attention, but it, it continues. And because those are fairly uh, clear routine cases, uh, the newer folks can handle those. And so everybody will move along as they get experience to handling more uh, complicated situations. So the, the people, like we just mentioned, uh, you don't want to call them mass denials, but the mass notifications that went out, those people who decide to do UI, you're saying that's just the best option and, and that moves a lot quicker. I mean, what if they're, they're denied that and they go to appeals and they wait longer? Yeah, um, at least then they're, they're in the right system, right? So, so for example, if it's been, de been determined that they do have W-2 wages, um, you want to get that claim going and that mowing. So that is the quickest way. Unless the person knows this is clearly a mistake. I haven't received W-2 wages, you know, of more than, uh, you know, $100 in the last year and a half, right? Then they might go forward with the appeal uh, with regard to PUA if they're also an independent contractor. You know, one of the goals that we also have is, you know, there's some other states' horrific websites on the differences between UI and PUA and FAQs. And again, we got to prioritize, and our priority is getting claims resolved. So we, we're, it's all hands on back on that. But that's a longer term goal, too, so that people just can quickly access really good information on their rights and how it all works. Um, you, we mentioned it briefly at the beginning of this interview, but uh, fraud has been a big problem um, here in the state of Nevada. Um, do you want to talk about, since you two have been in your, these roles, what is, has anything changed and um, what is being done to address uh, fraud and what sort of problems is it really creating for those who don't know? Um, I I think that uh, what we're what we're learning is that there are several with everything in the system, there it's it's complicated. There are several sort of variations on the theme. Um, just just from a sheer numbers perspective, for us to get to the people who really um, should be processed and if eligible get paid, we we with the number of claims we believe are um, not valid claims, we have to we still have to look at you know, 100 or 200 of those claims to get to the person that really is eligible and needs to be paid. So what a lot of these uh, claims are doing is slowing down the process just because the, the processing time that is required. Um, I am getting very concerned about people who were given inaccurate information maybe filed in uh, uh, the wrong system, not because they were trying to fraud us, but just they were given inaccurate information. If you are in the wrong system and you got paid money that you, when we go back and review, are not eligible for, that's going to create a situation where we've done an overpayment to you and, and we're going to have to ask people for money back. Very concerned about sort of the inaccurate information. Um, and uh, we did talk about some of the tools that we're using to really sort of get through that fraud so we can get to the um, claims that really we can resolve something for a Nevada. Uh, so we, we've, we've got lots of issues that we're juggling and it's just making everything harder for everyone uh, who's waiting and everybody in the system. Barbara, I don't know if there's anything on fraud. Do you want to talk about it at all? It, it's just a, it's just alarming to see the extent of it, right? Uh, on the UI side, you have people filing in the names of legitimate people, uh, right? A claim was filed for me, right? My employer gets it and says, well, Barbara's still working, right? And, and you have to report that. And so then the fraud staff have to note it on the file, right? Um, so you have that whole scheme going on. Then on the PUA side, you know, and again, these are these are mostly criminals, right? It's not one individual isn't really sure where to file. This is like a criminal enterprise. So, um, you know, all of that will be turned over to law enforcement, of course, and is being, uh, you know, done. But, you know, and I, our commitment, right, is we need to help the eligible Nevadans, right, and not have them suffer because of, 
you know, these enterprises. So, and I know there's thousands of people waiting for their benefits, but I mean, I've also done stories, I've done a lot of stories on this. Um, business owners and, and employees who've had, um, who are still working, had someone file under their name and they, they submit that this broad paperwork and they don't hear anything back. Is that all they need to do is, I know one gentleman said all he had to do is fax something in. If someone does send in this information, are they okay? Or what is a suggestion for people like that? You know, a great new flyer that we just updated with instructions for employers and instructions for anyone who believes their ID will in and is being utilized. You know, we had some major date national data breach cases, and I, I tend to think this is a fallout from those. But we'd love to have you include that on your website and get that out to your viewers, and it has step-by-step step what we recommend folks do. I'm going to have you repeat that just because it did break up a little bit. Um, uh, we, um, uh, Dieter has recently prepared a flyer which has step-by-step step what employers should do and what individuals who believe their identities have been stolen should be doing to protect themselves. You know, it's my theory that with these national data breaches that, you know, folks' identities are now being utilized. We're seeing the fallout from that. So people need to be aware of what to do. I, mean, I guess some people are concerned that, I mean, a business owner, I, I've done stories of people come pop into my mind, um, insurance company, he, he submitted the paperwork, but he's worried when down the line that Dieter's going to come after him for the money, but he did send his fraud paperwork in, but he never received anything back. Did he just keep everything he has just in case proof? What is the suggestion on that part? Or would that flyer address everything that people should be sending? So, of course, it never hurts to keep documentation of what you've done. I, I, I will defer to Barbara, who is the lawyer, but I'm sure she would tell you, you know, you should always keep your documentation. Um, but the early on in the pandemic, uh, Dieter did sort of put out a statement that uh, as long as employers are following up and noting that it is fraud, that the person is still employed, uh, they will not, uh, we don't come back against them and charge them for those cases. Uh, that's always been the rule. So people just need to let us know about the fraud. Uh, and yes, it's always a good idea to keep the documents. Uh, we are trying to update, again, the, the notice that they get back so they, they see that we've received it uh, and that they've done what they need to do. And, and again, you know, sometimes those updates to the computer systems just are take longer and would take away from our focus on getting processes resolved. I'm hoping that in a couple of weeks we can do a lot of these cleanup uh, coding projects. I think we lost Barbara, but I'll continue the questions with you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so other states um, implemented different measures such as, uh, I think we're getting someone out of me on the phone here and I believe it's her, let me add her. Yep, and I'm going to have to wrap up in five minutes because I'm running late to another. <laughs> no problem. I will have to take some more questions. As soon okay. as she joins on here, I hear her. Let me add our camera. Okay. Barbara, I think we can hear you, but we can't see you. There she is. There we go. All right, my, I believe my, uh, there's just too much demand on Cox communication Wi-Fi right now. I get it. We're almost done. I'm just going to have you turn your camera sideways, though. <laughs> there we go. All right. So my question here was, um, I know you talked about welfare workers joining as well, but other states have talked about National Guard. Has there been any talks of that in Nevada? Um, yes, the, the governor did uh, mention that, and um, he basically said when he set up this strike force and asked Elisa to come on as acting director, that whatever resources we need, um, please ask, because he's committed to resolving this backlog. The National Guard is pretty well tapped, um, but uh, the governor told us to come back if we felt we couldn't get enough resources elsewhere. Fortunately, we have volunteers from the Welfare Division, the Congressional offices. I mean, we have no shortage of volunteers now and others who are willing to join forces and help. Even the Strike Force, again, all folks who have come forward to say, I want to volunteer, we want to help Nevadans. So we're in good shape on that front. 
Okay, real quick, Elisa, uh, I'm going to ask you this next question that we know we're running out of time. Um, so this week, uh, we announced that Dieter, or the state of Nevada, will be applying for the Lost Wages Assistance Program. Um, the application is going to be sent. So where are we with that, and how long will it take? I know it's hard to, to tell how long it will take for people to get money. I know Arizona was the first one to do it. They were pretty quick. Um, where are we with that, and, and, and uh, how long do you think it will take? Um, so we are in the process of putting together our application. This is a unique and new program that is actually a joint operation between the Department of Labor and FEMA. So we, we have to work with our emergency management team here in the state. Uh, so we are getting our application together as quickly as we can. Uh, I have to say we're watching with uh, great concern because FEMA has made it very clear that when the funds run out, the program is done. Uh, so even if our application is uh, accepted and approved, uh, we would only probably have three weeks of this benefit to offer to folks. Uh, again, it's a different program, so the eligibility rules are different, yet again, from the other two. So not everybody who got the $600 uh, bump would be eligible for the $300 bump. Uh, and we're mostly worried that the money is going to run out even before we get there. Most of the CARES Act uh, work that has happened, every state has been given an allocation, so we weren't in this race for the money. This is a little bit different. Um, so, uh, and, and because there's very limited amount of money to spend to build this new program, we can't uh, start that work until we get an approved grant application, which we don't know if we're going to get. Uh, and our technical team said it would take about four weeks to actually build once we get to that point. So there are a lot of steps between here and uh, people getting money if we even get an approved application. I guess uh, even myself, I mean, I've been following this. Um, was this did you need the governor, did Dieter need the governor's approval to, to submit this? Because, I mean, I interviewed uh, the unemployment office from Arizona this week, and I mean, right when it was announced, it was basically the application was sent. I guess, why did it take more than a week to get that, that approval? Um, um, Joe, this is Barbara, just, just chiming in. The program is not very good, right? It's not going to cover the same number of people. It's only going to last three weeks. It's only $300. You know, folks were getting $600. It's our hope, it's certainly my hope, that Congress goes back in and from the very day the $600 stopped, they reauthorize it to all states, including ours, so that people can continue to get this money especially in states with high unemployment rates like Nevada. This program is just not very well put together. And so I think part of it is just weighing, do you do this or do you ho just hope Congress does the right thing? And I think in the end, Nevada said, well, we're going to make a claim for it because our people need it and deserve it. But gosh, from my point of view, I sure hope that Congress just goes in and reinstitutes the other program. It'll be much better for the people that need it. And I, I totally understand that. But I guess there's people out there who next week they can't pay their rent. Next, yeah, next week for September, they won't be able to pay their rent. And then this money, they're, they're seeing other states get it. And now they're scratching their heads wondering why didn't Nevada do something? And I, I feel for these people. And it, it's, I guess they're just still wondering why nothing was done, regardless if it's bad or good. It's money that they're not getting and they could be getting. Yeah, it's just, I think the way that it was set up, um, it's not going to flow quickly to these states, um, including ours. And so, um, you know, in the end, uh, you know, the decision was made to not leave any money on the table, right, to, to go forward with it. But uh, the best way to get money to people quickly is for Congress to re-implement the other program. Every time they create a program with different rules, it causes delay to people. And they can't wait. So, you know, my, my sense is just re-up the one that's already going. It'll be quicker and it will help more people. All right, almost done here. Uh, on that topic real quick, though, was it the, you guys, did Dieter need the governor's 
hey, okay, let's do this, fourth to do that, right? Yes, because again, this is a this is a new program, and it involves it, the application. Actually, goes through FEMA, um, and we don't have the relationship with FEMA. The emergency management uh, department has that, and they also have their plate full with COVID response. And so, to um, you know, we we just had to make sure that the whole the whole state team could come together and do this. And it's you couldn't have picked two departments in the state that were more taxed. Um, so, you know, it's, we have to work together as a state. That is the commitment, but we always have to, when we're looking at a significant commitment of resources, we always have to evaluate, is that the best place to put our efforts and our resources? So yes, we had to get uh, the okay of the governor. And um, literally we were getting new guidance every day on what these applications would look like. Uh, so it was hard to get to a stopping point where we could analyze even what what we were being asked to do. Um, I don't know how the other states do it. I really don't have time to <laughs> focus on that. Uh, so we we have to do the best job we can with the information we have. All right, Lisa, I know you have to go here in a moment. So last question here. Um, any, any suggestions you have for Nevadans out there who are still at home waiting uh, for any sort of uh, answer of a phone, um, email. Um, I know there's workers at Dieter working in, day in, day out to get their job done. Uh, what would you say to those Nevadans at home who are, are still still waiting? And, and, um, and I'm sure they're, they were really eager to hear from both of you, so we appreciate that again. But what would you say to them? Uh, I'm going to start and then I'll let Barbara have the last word because I think she's the most passionate advocate for those folks who are waiting. Um, I, I want to say one, the, the staff here at Dieter are working night and day incredibly hard. I don't think any of them have taken a day off since the pandemic started. Um, and so it, I, I know people are frustrated, but they really deserve our thanks uh, for the, just the dedication that they are putting in to try and make uh, an overwhelmed system at least keep moving. Uh, I think one of the things I've learned, which we've said many times, is that um, it's a fairly narrow set of criteria you must meet to be eligible for one of these programs. Uh, and so um, I, I, I get concerned when I hear people say, you know, the, I'm just waiting for this. Um, these programs are designed to be short term. People, uh, we need to sort of reach out, and this is, this is something we're doing, we need to reach out and say, what else can we do to help people? And, and families need to start thinking about what else are they going to do? Because this has always been a temporary program to help them get from where they are to the next job or the next sort of set of resources they have. So folks, have to start planning um, and, and we're gonna do what we can to help give them other resources. Um, and our commitment is we're, we're bringing in all the staff we can to start calling folks, getting them there uh, through the process. Uh, I know uh, it's not any consolation to anyone to say, just be patient, um, but literally we have hundreds of new staff coming on which will help us process. Uh, folks' cases uh, and move them on to either payment if they're eligible or just tell them what's going on with their case and what the decision is. So um, I volunteered um, to um, lead this rapid response team because I was so moved by all the stories I was hearing from people who felt like they were being ignored and who were waiting weeks and weeks. And um, there's a number now of volunteers um, in this effort to do all we can to get through the backlog and to get people the answers they deserve. So um, we are going to continue with laser focus to get that done. And so, um, I am honored to lead this effort and I'm grateful to all of the people who have stepped forward to say, what can I do to help? And um, we are going to get through this backlog. We are going to build a better system for the future. We're going to improve every part of it. 
communications, time and processing, so that people can get answers and the benefits they deserve. So the, the real quick, sorry, the training right now is happening for those welfare workers. You expect this backlog to move maybe a little quicker here in the near future? Yes, and we're measuring it, right? We're measuring the backlog and we're measuring um, the progress and then identifying, hey, could we, is there a way to get 10,000 people approved in the next four days? That's the kind of dialogue and discussion we're having. How can we do things better but quicker? That's the goal of the task force.